Good evening, everybody. My name is Elizabeth McCrum. I'm one of the Pro Vice Chancellors here at the University of Reading, Pro Vice Chancellor for Education and Student Experience. But I'm here this evening, I think, wearing my hat as University Executive Board Champion for Disability. Um, this is the point where I'm asked to give a visual description of myself, which is always the bit I find most difficult of the whole evening. But I would say I'm five foot seven, I have shoulder length, brownish hair, and big glasses. And hopefully that's enough to give a bit of a bit of a sense. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome you this evening to this year's Disability History Month event. Um, it's around the theme of Disability History Month this year, which is Disability Children and Youth, Overcoming Challenges and Embracing Opportunities. Uh, it's part of uh, a series of flagship events that we have for LGBTQIA+, for Black History uh, Month and for Women's History Month as well. Um, we launched this event and neurodiversity review, which took place last year, and one of the outcomes of that was a desire to promote the lived experiences of our colleagues and our students and our community and to hear more about their stories and more about their successes so that's part of the aims of this evening. Um, I'm delighted to be joined this evening by a, an expert panel who are going to share their experiences and thoughts on the subject, but there are a few things I've been brief to mention before we begin. Um, so I'm going to shortly hand over to those panellists to introduce themselves. And then after that, we will have approximately 40 minutes of panel discussion. And that's going to incorporate uh, questions that you might have. So some are pre-submitted questions that we've had on key themes, uh, but there will also be the opportunity for you to ask questions as well, both those of you in the room and who are joining us online and the event we're due to close just before 7 p.m. Uh, so welcome, welcome online, and welcome to our White Nights campus, for those of you that join us from the community. Um, those of you that are online, you are uh, able to post questions to us this evening. You uh, can do that in the Q&A function online, and there is the opportunity to post questions anonymously if you wish, uh, but, but there's not an opportunity to share uh, audio, audio audio with us this evening, so please do get busy typing in the Q&A if there's things that you would like to ask us. Um, also, if you would like to switch on the automatic captioning, then you can press the appropriate CC icon, which will enable you to do that. Uh, for those of you joining us here uh, in the room this evening, we will pause at various points to enable you to ask your questions, which are really important to us this evening. You can do that by raising your hand, but I also think the events team have put around the room uh, pieces of paper and pens, so if you would uh, prefer to write down your question, that's absolutely fine. And um, when we go to questions, I think it will be, I think it's going to be Tina and Emma are going to be coming out with microphones so that we can hear your questions, or if you hand them a question that you've written down, they'll be able to share those with us, and they will also be posing some of the questions that have been posted online. Um, and we do also have a designated quiet space, which is in room G04, which is just, just down the corridor uh, for those of you here this evening who need that, that time and the space at any point during the proceedings. And for anybody in the room, please do feel free to come and go as you see fit and as appropriate. Uh, we're joined tonight by our two BSL interpreters. So I'm really pleased to welcome Felicity and Anna. Uh, and they will be taking it in terms to interpret for us this evening. And finally, if you please note that the event is being recorded, 
and I believe is going to be shared on social media channels of the Reading University site. But for those of you in the room, please just be reassured that the only people that will be visible on that recording are the panellists and myself and um, Felicity and Anna. But if you do ask a question, then that audio will be able to be heard as well. So do bear that in mind. OK. So I think that's everything I've been instructed to say at the start. Um, so now I move on to the panel discussion part of our event, and I am absolutely delighted to introduce our panellists. So first of all, Demi Chanduska-Watt, who's a current member of the Great Britain Women's Para Ice Hockey Team. Thank you. Uh, Ruth Pierce, founder and CEO of Berkshire-based charity Parenting Special Children. I got the wrong, wrong order. <laughs> we looked at there. So, uh, Anna Takalaki, who's lecturer in education here at the University of Reading in our institution of education, and Sophie Flecknell, who's the disabled students officer for Reading Students Union. And this is the point where I actually uh, invite them in turn to introduce themselves, say a few words about themselves and their role and why they're joining us on the panel tonight. And if you wouldn't mind starting uh, with just a bit of a visual description of yourself as well uh, to help us out. So, Danny, it looks like uh, it looks like the microphone stopped with you. So if you can start us off just for about two minutes. That would be great. Thank you. Um, I am five foot three, but sitting in a wheelchair. Um, I have long brown hair, and I think that's as far as I'll go. Um, I was injured in 2017. I sustained a spinal cord injury while playing rugby. Um, I have always played sport um, and that's how I found myself five years later playing for Great Britain para ice hockey. Um, I describe it as rugby on ice. Some people may think why on earth would you go back but we can't help how we're made. Um, and I think that's about it. Far as I go with my description. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ruth Pierce. Um, I'm five foot two. Um, I have brown, sort of curly hair I've changed over the years. Um, and I guess, yeah, glasses. Um, so um, I'm founder and CEO of Parenting and Special Children. I set up the charity 18 years ago to meet an unmet need. So I have a daughter who's 24 who is autistic, ADHD and has a learning disability um, and there was no support when we, she was diagnosed. So I set up a charity and worked with thousands of families um, and it's been an amazing journey. Hi, I'm Susan Blackmore, disabled students also for writing students union. So my role is kind of to advocate for the students and try and make sure their uh, university experience is positive. Um, personally, I'm autistic. I have multiple chronic illnesses and um, I also have mental health conditions as well. Hello, I'm Anna. I'm, I am a lecturer at the Institute of Education. Oh, I should start with describing myself. Um, I never learned how to measure my height in feet, so I'll give it to you in metres and centimetres. <laughs> I'm 1 metre 67 last time I checked my identity. Um, my, my passport. You may tell from my accent that um, I, I come from a Mediterranean place. It's Greece where I come from. I work as a lecturer in education at the Institute of Education um, and I am here as both an educator of um, students with uh, special educational needs and disabilities um, at the Institute of Education as a director of the programme for SENCOs, SENCOs are the leaders in uh, primary and secondary schools that look after provision for SEMD, for special educational needs and disabilities. So I work a lot with those professionals, but also, um, also as a researcher, um, working with families and uh, young children, young learners, and uh, young adults with SEND disabilities, specifically uh, anything that is to do with reading difficulties um, uh, or, or other um, uh, disabilities that affect the, the literacy development. 
thank you very much to our panel for those great introductions um, and welcome you all very warmly to the panel this evening. Now I'm going to start off with a question that I'll pose to all of you in turn and it's really a question about barriers. It's a question about the barriers that you think that disabled and neurodivergent children and young people face in today's society. Anna, would you like to, you're holding the microphone, would you like to start us off? What sort of barriers do you see them facing? Yes, I'm not going to talk um, from a personal perspective, obviously, but what I see um, in my students and discussing with the professionals I work with, um, one of the main barriers um, are to, is to do with communication. Um, so lots of times um, individuals with disabilities and the professionals that work with them or their family members are stuck in their own silos without being able to access the support the learners need um, and um, they're having trouble communicating their needs um, to the stakeholders that are responsible for putting uh, provision in place. And on the other hand, um, stakeholders uh, or professionals that work with young learners um, may not feel empowered enough by the system to, um, to, to, to put the support that the families and the learners provide. So um, in, in the course of this discussion, I'm hoping to talk a little bit more about uh, co-production and what it means to involve everybody um, in the discussion of what is needed. That might be a good segue actually to Ruth in the, in the sense that um, you mentioned in your introduction that uh, a lack of provision and support was part of the motivation for you for setting up your charity. Yeah, so um, I've got some notes here. Um, so my uh, barrier was um, it's actually about education. That is the biggest challenge for families we support. And it's a one size fits all. I'm not being political here at all. It, it's, it's really challenging. Um, and that means that children and young people don't reach their potential, particularly neurodivergent children and young people. Um, and that's a huge barrier. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe we'll get a bit more of a sense of the, what some of the barriers, the details of that barrier and some of the things that we might do during the course of this discussion. Sophie, you are by your own admission a young person who, uh, what your, what's your perspective of the sorts of barriers that, uh, that young people may be facing? So, um, well, I've seen a lot in the neurodivergent community especially, but I think it's true for all disability is the, the effect of stereotyping and stigmatisation. Um, for example, neurodivergent children receive less support and understanding because of the misconceptions around their conditions. That even goes through to teaching materials in educational institutions. Um, it can leave young ch children and young people feeling unheard. Um, I mean, how many times have we heard things like they're only a little bit autistic or they have mild ADHD? Um, another area that impacts is chronic illness. For example, if you're a young person, um, trying to explain your own difficulties or needs, or if you have a mobility aid like a walking stick, people just say to you, you're too young to struggle with that because they have the misconceptions around those conditions and those needs. Thank you. Danny? Um, yeah, like I wasn't a disabled child, but I've worked with um, I actually mentored a disabled boy. We had the same injury. I think he was more mentoring me, but he didn't know that. <laughs> but I used to go into school because he felt very isolated and the teachers didn't know how to include him into PE lessons. And it was something simple like, well, have you tried putting him in goal? Have you asked him? And they're like, he can't play football. Well, we ain't going to kick it, of course. But he actually really still now enjoys going in goal and he's now in year 10 and I started this when he was in year four and I think it's people see an aid or they'll see a child misbehaving and they'll just assume they know what they need but sometimes I just think the simple thing is asking someone what they need because we are still human and we can actually answer for ourselves most of the time. 
Danny, I wonder if I might follow up with you and then come to Sophie and ask you a little bit about your own personal experiences of the sorts of barriers and challenges you faced and how you've overcome them. I think the biggest barrier, I think a lot of people would assume I was 27 when I was injured. So going from an active personal trainer that was on my feet all the time and buzzing around, I had two children at the time and then suddenly on a flip of a coin I'm relying on people and being reliant and I think for me it's overcoming feeling like being a burden and I feel like again I can't speak for everybody but I feel like if you have a disability it's very easy to become like a burden because you are asking for things you are having to scam more than what you I did before when I was an able-bodied person and didn't have to think 10 steps ahead I just had to turn up. Sophie? Um, so one of the biggest challenges that I faced um, from the perspective of someone who's autistic has chronic illnesses and mental health conditions Firstly, being diagnosed with the conditions and getting the right diagnosis, but then getting that support in place afterwards. Um, so in secondary school, I was undiagnosed autistic and I was told so many times that I couldn't have certain support until I was diagnosed with conditions. And then when I did uh, get diagnosed, it was still a struggle to get in place. Um, I was really lucky to have the help of my parents with that and they advocated for me and they still advocate for me. but. Um, I'm particularly grateful that my dad's taught me how to advocate for myself um, at college and university and other areas of my life. Um, but it still takes more time and it's more difficult than it should be to get the support in place. Um, and it's not something that I really have overcome, but I'm continuously overcoming that. I think my next question is going to be for all of you, but perhaps we'll start with Anna and Ruth. Um, and it's really it's a question about the what or Ruth now, um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the extent to which it made things worse and increased barriers, particularly for um, children and young people who are disabled and or neurodivergent, or the extent to which there was progress. I just wanted your, your thoughts. Yeah, so I'm I'm speaking on behalf of families. <coughs> parent and also working with so many families. So um, I like the word same storm, different boats or different boats and very much that was the case what we saw. So we had families with children in specialist schools who maybe had two staff to one. They were then at home with maybe just one parent or maybe two um, working parents as well um, and our our calls to our helpline increased from say half an hour per call to over an hour per call. So we had families in real crisis, um, you know, really difficult times for them. On the other hand, there were neurodivergent children and young people who much preferred not to be in school. So actually benefited from learning online and didn't have the same sensory mm -hmm. challenges, um, uh, social communication challenges. So it, it was yeah, a different story for different people. And also um, many families of children, um, neurodivergent children, young people or special needs, really struggle with isolation. And in a way, everyone felt that isolation. So in some ways, maybe, you know, families thought, well, actually people maybe have a greater understanding of this isolation that is, is such a challenge. I think it's going to end. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. And I'm covered through it. Thank you. <laughs> and so that's definitely what uh, we saw um, with a research project we did during the pandemic. And you're actually summarizing what the families told us. Um, especially, I don't know if if this if you could you saw this with the families you were working with during the pandemic, but um, to begin with, everybody was shocked with what was happening. So we were all in the same boat. And this um, somehow, for some families, this somehow helped them to 
to to understand uh, what it is like for uh, families that um, have to face isolation for other reasons that have to do with um, disability. Um, uh, what we also saw in this data that we collected is that uh, people were reaching out uh, to other families online. So a lot of lots of online groups started during the pandemic with this specific um, purpose to support each other yeah. because they were feeling um, they they weren't getting the support they needed either from the school or the local authority. I'm, I'm going to talk in education terms because that's where I work, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure social workers and health care carers were also in the same situation. They were kind of constrained and no one knew when the next wave will be um, will be out. And to balance this out, we also saw what you um, mentioned uh, as other individuals, individual families um, and learners with disabilities enjoying being at home and having more time with their carers, their um, principal carers um, and also um, Parents are, are, are experts in, uh, in their children in many ways. They understand their needs uh, much better. And this was, was a brilliant time where they could actually say that um, to the school. So that the parents and carers were the main source of information for the children's school on how they were doing with their learning, how they were doing with their well-being. So these situations sparked new channels of communication between the families, some some families and their schools um, relevant to getting getting more information from the parents uh, about the child and their needs. Thank you. And I think we'll come back in a minute to think a little bit more about education in a future facing way. But Sophie, I don't know if you had any thoughts in relation to COVID. Yeah, so um, you both really talked about kind of the online being beneficial for a lot of people, but I also wanted to kind of mention the flip side to that. Um, so, for example, it's really difficult to get support for anything in face to face at the moment. Um, when I came to university in 2021, um, I really struggled to find anyone who would uh, do in person mentoring for me that the disabled students allowance said that I needed. Um, and someone has to travel from over an hour um, to get to me. So there is this really beneficial kind of everything's online now and it's really helpful for people who have like reduced mobility mm. or dynamic conditions or who, who are neurodivergent, but there's also the flip side to that as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I kind of back that up. It's, I haven't done it as a, when I started my open university, it was all online and that that was great because it was started during the pandemic and then it went in class and I, my attendance dropped because I struggle as well as I have a pain condition. Like I suffer from nerve pain and sometimes there's no matter what you do, you cannot overcome it other than laying there and just like grim and bearing it until it passes. Um, and then I think the positive outcome of it is I think people understood what isolation was like and I think a lot of people in our world live in isolation sometimes like it's quite a nice you do feel alone um, you can be in a crowd room with people when you're the only person there that has your your thing it's so people kind of open their eyes up to the isolation part of it. Oh, thank you. So thinking about education and thinking forward, what can we learn? How can we better support those with special educational needs and disabilities? Um, as you're holding the microphone, then you might seem like a good place to start with. OK, so um, I did some reading and um, the Children's Commission in England in March 2023 asked um, neurodivergent um, children and people about and said about what they wanted for a better world and they said to be understood, seen and heard. 
to benefit from a fantastic, ambitious education in mainstream school, where possible and support at school when they need it. Um, I love that. I think that's that says it for everyone. They need to be understood, seen and heard. Um, so for me um, and for them, <laughs> I think that what needs to happen is um, there needs to be comprehensive training in education and also in teacher training. So from what I understand around teacher training, um, and I could be wrong, so I can be corrected here, it might be half a day or it's, it's very limited and it's an absolutely massive subject, um, disability, and it's so interesting and it's life changing when we get it right, the support. So it's that's that absolutely needs to change in my opinion. Um, and also, sorry, I'm using notes here because I really wanted to make sure that I said the points. I've got one more point. Yeah, I, I guess the more that we understand and embrace and truly understand, that doesn't cost money. It's really about wanting to do what's right and listening to every individual child. So because you're neurodivergent, um, you, you, you're still unique in your own person. So it's that desire to really know what works for that child and young person makes such a difference and for families. Um, that's so, so important too. So those are my little things. And uh, obviously your experience in spans the the um, uh, education in primary and secondary as well as higher education work and of course obviously you do a lot of work in terms of the training of teachers and the SENCOs as you said in the introduction. Inter introduction. Um, I will give you my views, but I would I would rather hear uh, what the rest of the panel has to say about that. Um, I will agree with Ruth once again. I think we should work together. <laughs> um, what I hear from Sen the Senkos I work with is that they often feel they are the only people responsible in the school, in their setting, for making it right. Um, so one of the principles I would say that uh, can go across the levels is to make inclusion or send provision everybody's business really. Um, so if we all as teachers and educators, I, I will speak um, on their behalf because I used to be one and I am now one in higher education. If we all make it our, our business, then uh, I think that's a main principle that can, can lead to much more um, success. But I am also very pro listening to the person, as Ruth said, um, ask, asking what their needs are, um, asking permission to, to change things in a way that uh, may help them discuss this with them along the way. I understand, we all understand, I would suppose, I would think, we all understand that it is not always possible to put in place what um, the learner, the individual with uh, SEND may ask for, but um, that's the, the value of communication and flexibility. Um, so having and um, taking advantage of this, um, I think this step um, forwards that we did during the pandemic of listening to families, uh, family members and the individuals um, and and also so getting closer to the professionals that work with them, um, I think is something that we can take advantage in these future steps as we go out of this situation. Thank you. Sophie, I wonder if we might turn to you now and your knowledge and experience of higher education. Um, and first of all, do you think that there are perceived barriers to coming to university, to joining university from uh, students who might have a disability, for example? Um, I don't want to be too direct, but I don't think there are really any perceived barriers that aren't actual barriers mm -hmm. um, that cause kind of actual distress to disabled students. Um, I mean, there is support available um, at university and higher education in general, but it isn't very well known about. 
and it's difficult to get in place. It's not as straightforward as you might think. Um, I mean, some disabled students might not go to university because they're worried and um, they might be worried about the accessibility of campus, about the accommodation, about so many different things. They might not even know about disabled students allowance. Um, and even if they do know about that, that's a really long process. You have to have your assessment approved by student finance. You have to complete the assessment, wait for the report, um, wait for student finance to approve the report and then wait and get all the support in place. Um, and get all your equipment in the So you're already kind of halfway through the term by the time that that happens. Um, and universities can't really do much without the help of disabled students allowance. So those kind of perceived barriers, I feel like they are quite real um, and not just perceived barriers that aren't there. I'll take that one. That. I think that's a fair, fair point. Um, what else can we do? As universities, what else can we do to break down barriers to make a more accessible experience? Um, have you seen the examples of good practice that you would you would share with us? We work together with unions, for example. You were from student union. Yeah, um, the main thing that universities can do is work with the students, which I have seen really good examples of. Um, they just need to be included in every single decision that affects them, get their constant feedback. Um, for example, at the Student Union, we're hoping to, in the near future, collect kind of student feedback on the physical accessibility of campus, um, including the Student Union building, um, using a paid research project. So um, that will kind of get the feedback, and then I think the ways that um, we're kind of currently collaborating. The main one is kind of the raising awareness for events like this, for Disability History Month. And the second way is there are, there are a lot of uh, kind of student union officers and student representatives that are on committees and groups held by the university just to kind of get that perspective and represent the students' interests. So I think that is happening really, really well. That's really helpful, thank you. I think it's probably just a moment to pause and to take some questions that you might have. Um, we've got some, we've got a microphone that might come to you if we end up, or if we've got, um, uh, if you've got a written question, you can pass that to us. And if there are any questions online, we might pose those as well. So, um, Are you taking mine, Jack? Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't, probably don't need a request, uh, microphone. I'm used to shouting in front of people. Oh, so just in order all day. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want me to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And hi, and thank you very much to everybody uh, for attending really interesting topic. Um, um, has Reading University done anything to benchmark itself against other universities in terms of the provision it makes? Um, for people with different abilities um, and, and if not, what things do the panellists think it could do um, to try and, you know, show it. The university makes a, a lot of um, promotion of really good things it does do, like number of, it wants to be in the top three for sustainability, wants to be in the top this and that, but I, ha I haven't seen anything that says we want to be in you know, a, a leader in supporting people with different abilities. So just a, yeah, various questions in one really, but what do we do anything and what could be done to the panel I mean, I, I think I'm very happy to ask the panel what we could do. It might not be fair to ask them what we have done. I'm also aware that we've got Yotta in the room as well, who's um, chair of our uh, staff disability network. Um, and I think that the first thing probably that comes to mind is that work that has been done over the last couple of years on our disability, neurodiversity and chronic and long-term illnesses review. And, and as Yotta did much more of the leading on that and working on that, but she's free, very free to interrupt me at any point here. Um, and we'll quite happily pass you the microphone. But part of that and part of the process of doing that was a lot of listening. And it was listening to, to our staff, to our colleagues, but also looking to the sector, looking to the sector and experiences that, that were happening across the sector, it's good practice. It was very much research informed as well, Yotta, wasn't it? And you did a lot of that work 
this what I'm sort of um, um, looking at you. So there's, there's some work that has been done there that's been part of that review and then a set of actions that we have been working on and are working on and will continue to work on that come from, from that review. But more importantly, if there are things that you think and probably again, put you on the spot, but are there any, is there anything that comes to mind? Anybody, any other thoughts, things we could be could be doing? If you want to say, so, you don't yeah, have to. Sorry, I yeah. actually made it yeah. clear, I suppose, yeah. I was particularly thinking about students, whereas yeah. I think the answer you were giving was more about what's been done for staff mm -hmm. or the university yeah. as an employer, yeah. which is a big, it's very important as well, but I was actually really thinking, because we're talking this about young people in particular. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think you did, but sorry. Yeah. Um, can I say that maybe a starting point was recognising the provision and comparing ourselves against ourselves to the provision against students and against staff in terms of disability. And in, and in terms of students, the best solutions are solutions that are put forward in collaboration because we want the same thing. So when it was discussed about the accessible site, this, this is an important provision for staff and students. Um, benchmarking there, there is data out there, and we, we've got that data to compare ourselves. But what is also important for us, and we can talk more about what we are doing or what we have done, but what is also important, an important message we want to pass, is that every lived experience is an important experience. So it's more about qualitative data rather than numbers. And we have to be very careful, I feel, about numbers. We need to be inclusive by design rather than relying on numbers. We don't want to force people to disclose if they don't feel that it is a safe and cost benefit analysis in disclosing. So I think the best way forward is to look what makes inclusive provision, looking at the university design for learning and putting forward provision for curriculum, for um, spaces, for the way that we communicate and organise events like this one that are good for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just to add to those comments, I'm really interested in your um, narrative about the support that disabled people get and that you have to waste a student until about halfway through the term to get that support. Um, I've got one um, student who is neurodivergent, has somebody who's dyslexic, um, and somebody has, who has a mild form of um, ASD and it made me realise, I suppose, that we have we need to get that support for to work and things like that. And the fact that you have to pay for a dyslexia um, test, I wanted to support the support the student, but I was thinking, well, we need to get that test to confirm the diagnosis of, of the support. Um, so I had to really think about, okay, what are their rights? How can I support them anyway? Um, and also comparing it, I suppose I, I'm not, um, I could compare it to a little bit to, for example, like um, hearing loss. Um, and you can get something called a, a Roger pen, um, which is a device that you can, that hearing, um, hearing loss use, and it records what's going on and it can improve the quality of the um, audio as well. So it's thinking about the provision, I suppose. Um, and if they're not, you know, I'm not really, I'm finding that students aren't very satisfied with what they're getting in terms of support. Um, your comment about they want to be seen and heard and understood. I think that's really key and such an important thing for all of us to remember. Um, and think about the through education, not just in the university. So it's not really a question, but I wanted to share my experiences with you. Thank you. Thanks, Alain. I'm going to read out some pretty submitted questions. Um, we've been asked to see if there's any advice regarding autism spectrum disorder and anxiety. Any advice on that? It's quite, that's quite a big question for you. It is. Um, I would say to the person um, on the line, um, to, there are national organisations who you can go to for support. There's local organisations that you can go to support for support. Um, so contact one of those local, if you can, I mean, parents, especially children, 
we're, we're you know approach us and we can give support with that um yeah does that help sorry i can't can you repeat the question yes it, so it was advised regarding autism spectrum disorder and anxiety so they basically want to find some advice yeah, I mean, there's a National Autistic Society. I mean, I'll let you answer as well. <laughs> Here we are. Um, but you, there is a lot of information out there. Um, do, would you like to say something on that? Also, like, uh, yeah. So, um, or contact us. I can find out anything on that subject. Um, Thank yeah. you. And um, there's another question being asked as well. What did the panel think the university could do to improve, increase the provision of the participation in sports and disabled students and maybe also the local community? Well, that's probably that's probably a nice segue into where I was going next, Danny. <laughs> um, you'll be unsurprised to know that I have some questions about sport for you. Um, and perhaps so we start more broadly and then we can come and think a little bit about universities as well. But what do you think is working well to enable access to competitive sport? And then what do we, what do we need to do better? And then perhaps we can then think about universities and what role they might play. I think what's working well is my understanding as I've only been in the disabled sporting world for a couple of years now is there are a lot more clubs or there is a lot more there's a lot more out there that people can see so people were unaware of certain sports or they were unaware that everybody could play a wheelchair sport disabled people don't have to just play disabled sport um, it's actually, it, it's a, you know, like wheelchair tennis. I can play wheelchair tennis with my children. I can swim with my children. There's lots of things we can all do together. And I think that's what's working well is there's a lot more broader advertisement for that. Um, things that I think universities, schools can do better to make it more competitive is actually have teams like there's nothing stopping each university having a basketball team because anyone can jump in a chair anyone with a physical impairment anyone who hasn't got a physical impairment can jump in and play competitive sports together and it's actually a really awesome way to bring everyone together like it's i i, I mean for me sport has t taught me resilience it's taught me how to you're not always going to win at everything and i think it geared me up to taking on this life you know i think if i didn't come from a sporting background i don't think i would have been able to you know face the biggest challenge of my life you know in the face and think i'm you're not going to win and i think that's from a stubborn sport personality thank you um Perhaps if we have a think now also about family life and Ruth, maybe it's a good place to start with you and thinking about the, when you set up your charity and what your aims in relation to family were and the extent to which you've achieved those. Yeah, so I said um, my daughter was diagnosed um, learning disability first, um, eight, 18 months and um, I felt very alone and I didn't know where to turn. Um, she had diagnosis of global developmental delay, really not much on that. Um, wasn't Google, this was 24 years ago, not to the same extent that there was, but um, I can't remember that one. Um, anyway, there, were, there really was no support um, and I didn't know what the future was going to bring. I didn't know what was out there at all. Um, so what I wanted to do was to um, support families so that they didn't face the same situation so that they could find their group, that they could meet with other parents who were facing similar situations and that's been the journey of my life now and I think that's been the most enriching um, part of it is, is meeting with other families and sharing experiences and sharing knowledge 
um, sharing the same fights because it is a lot of fighting for what you need um, and that includes legal um, tribunals um, and that is a really hard place to be. So we, we, what we do is we, it's about empowering families and knowledge is power and so the more you understand about your child's diagnosis, the more understanding you are, the more you can be their advocate, um, which is immensely important. Um, and um, yeah, I'm reducing the isolation that I talked about. Um, so 18 years down the line, um, we've worked probably up to 15,000 families um, and they tell us we've made a real difference in their lives, which is um, amazing because they're hopefully they're feeling less isolated and they know where to turn so that they we can sign persons to organisations who can support them through the education system because you have to learn so many things about so many areas. Um, and we work with families who are facing really complex situations um, and they can't do some of that themselves. And so we, we we help them, we hold their hand through that process um, and then they're able to be empowered and do it themselves. What sort of advice do you give them to empower them other than coming to Parenting Special Children and to, to do that learning that you mentioned? What, what are the first things that you advise them to do? I guess it comes back to that the comment to be understood, seen and heard and what we do is we listen and that's you know, immensely powerful to listen. And then because of our lived experience, we will, we can easily signpost to organisations. So, um, yeah, I guess that's what we do. And then we set up children, young people's um, groups so that they can, at younger age, um, discover what it means to be neurodivergent and with other young people who are neurodivergent. So it's sort of a really holistic, it's for the whole family. Um, yeah. Thank you. Danny, I hope you don't mind me turning to you, but you're also a mum. Yes, yes. Three. Three, three lovely um, children. And what what impact does having a parent with a disability have on children? And what can we learn from their experiences? I mean, I wasn't always like this. My elder two, they had a hundred percent mum, I'd probably like to refer to myself as. Um, there was nothing that I couldn't do. Um, if they was up all night with an earache, I was there for them. So this might get me a bit, um, you know, but there are times now where I know they need mum and mum can't always be there. And my daughter, who is 18 months, she's gonna know no different. But I think it's very difficult for my elder two um, to sometimes navigate their new life because it wasn't just wasn't it wasn't the disability didn't just affect me and it, I think families it doesn't just affect that person it affects the whole family and I think people really need to understand it's family and friends in the close circle that that take the brunt of disabilities um so yes yeah, it's, it's is there anything is there anything that could be done better to support them yeah, like I think my daughter received from a charity backup. She received three phone calls, I think it was, from another child who had a parent with a spinal cord injury. But, but that was it. That's all the charity could afford. Um, where they've never had any therapy. They've ne we've never had any family support. We've never had, you know this is your new life, this is what's expected. We've literally gone down the rocky road. I mean, sometimes we have had some beautiful moments, but a lot of the time it's it's been a mess, but it's, you know, it's, it's our mess, it's our chaos, and we're trying our best to make it work. But I think there needs to be more done in especially supporting people that are injured like this, you know, not everyone is is born or, you know, some people have late diagnosis. It's like it's it's a huge it's, it's a huge like kick to you and it's a huge kick to the family where what what can be done more is I think schools, you know, schools if you find like I'm very lucky this this primary school that my children are at, they 
they were very understanding. You know, if they were late for pickup, they didn't. You never got that look. It was, you know, other parents were understanding and helpful. But again, not everyone has that. Not, not all schools are understanding, and not all workplaces are understanding. Thank you, Anna. Um, your work involves hearing lived experiences, and I wondered about your reflections on how they've informed your work and how they've informed your research. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's it's been a journey, as I am pretty sure everyone's journey with lived experiences um, will differ from time point to time point. I've increasingly uh, gradually started to listen more. That's why I always advocate for listening. Um, so um, I'm thinking that, and, and I go by that, that at the end of the day, research is useful or is worth doing if it's useful to somebody. Um, so I always start with um, discussing my ideas, listening to uh, people with lived experiences um, at different um, stages of, of the research. But I also um, wanted to promote community building. So I, I work a lot with communities, uh, with, with families, with professionals, and we try to exchange experiences. And I, I want to believe that I allow my research to be informed by um, the, their ideas, uh, what works for them, um, and uh, how they see um, the, the, the problem, let's, let's um, call it that. Um, so in, in a nutshell, I'm going to say that um, I go by this principle that uh, I want my research to be useful to, to people. Um, so I tend to listen at every stage of, of the research and try also to share what I do with as many people, as many communities as I can um, by uh, not only speaking to them, so going to the schools, going to the communities and talking to them, by um, making research findings open access through websites, by making open resources for teachers and families to, to use, um, uh, but also by talking to my students about it. And this links to the point about training earlier on, initial teacher training. Um, they are bound to sit in a class with classroom with me and, and listen to my research projects whenever whenever I have something new to um, to share with them. And um, this will vary vary from university to university, but at, at Reading, at the Institute of Education, we try to do a good job of talking to everybody about inclusion and special education needs and disabilities um, throughout different modules. And they also have um, teachers, trainee teachers, have the um, possibility if they want to do a, their own research project, their dissertation, on uh, something that is relevant to SCND and inclusion, so that they can apply this um, later. So I think in all those ways, I do my research and try to communicate it. Thank you. Um, and I, I, perhaps I'll just take us towards the future now, um, because we're, we're drawing towards a final opportunity for questions in a moment. So I'm just sort of, well, Elan was, was now, that's fine. Sorry. So just uh, quickly interrupt. Come on, just get the mic. Sorry, just to interrupt. You were talking about your um, experience with your daughter. Did she go to a mainstream school or a specialist school? Is that oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, mainstream primary and then specialist secondary um, and college and then residential college specialist. <coughs> Sophie, so which, which school did you go to? Did you go to a mainstream or a uh, special school? Um, I went to a mainstream primary school and then uh, like a grammar mainstream secondary. Sorry. The reason I ask because I was just wondering about the charges of your daughter and then the charges of you, Sophie. Is that in a mainstream setting or, or whether it was in a specialist school as well? 
I was just thinking we could have um, if we could all think about for the future is whether it's mainstream that we need to be focusing on more special schools. And, and I suspect a lot of your work is advocacy in terms of ensuring that young people get the appropriate provision in those settings. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really about the individual child and, and what they need. So for my daughter with a learning disability, our mainstream school was much more challenging. Um, yeah, so each child. Mm -hmm. Are there, if there are no other questions from the floor, or oh, we have a question online before I move to a final question for the panel. Mm. I'm very recently started sharing all about my story of being neurodivergent and disabled, which has been well received. I wanted to ask the panel, how can we support those with lived experiences to share their experiences? and to be advocates, but also to not burn out emotionally. Any thoughts from the panel? Who'd like to start us off? Take them? I think that's a really interesting one about the burnout. Um, there was um, Centre of Autism had an um, opening day, and there was an um, autistic um, university student speaking, and she said that when she started to unmask, so when she really, um, I guess, came to that realisation about her diagnosis, she said that was the most difficult time for her, and yet there wasn't the support that, that there, she felt there was more judgement. So I think it's you know, having that support at that time when people start to really embrace or begin to understand the diagnosis, um, the people around that can support. I hope I've answered that question properly. Thank you. Did we have any other questions? Um, What's being done about disabled people who are in the hospital and homeless system, as I witnessed some horrific things in my time? Also, what's being done about the police treatment for people with disabilities when in custody, as I was tortured with mine? That's probably a bigger question than... What's being done about disabled people who are in the hospital homeless system, as I witnessed some horrific things in my time? Also, what's being done about the police treatment of people with disabilities when in custody, as I was tortured with the mind? And I think they're really important issues to, to raise um, and to draw attention to the specific experiences and lived experiences of, um, of people and young people with disabilities and um, uh, who are neurodivergent in those circumstances. But probably a bigger question than, than, than we can answer here. Yes, I think we pause to think that the particular particular issues they might face. I'm going to ask one last question of the panel before we wrap up for this evening. Um, I'm going to ask you, what's your proudest moment to date? And what's the what's the next big goal that you're working towards? Who wants to start us off? Danny, do you want to help me to? Yeah. Proudest moment to date and next big thing you're working on? I think proudest moment to date, sport wise, we'll go with um, obviously making a national team of your chosen sport is actually is to wear your country's jersey, it's pretty incredible. I've uh, got to sing a national anthem a few times, so that means we've won. Um, <laughs> we uh, made it to the men's team, like we call it men's team, but there's actually it's when quite a minority uh, women in para sport in team sports so like to break out into men's team is, is was quite a had a big head from that and then i was, went on to be the first female to score in uh, the championships um, it shouldn't have took that long because there are some talented females uh, over the world that should have been given a roster spot sadly they haven't um, I wanted to do my, I think I've done two marathons, I wanted to do my third, I've stand around Antigua, like, 
I think sport wise, like that's um, them achievements. I think proudest moment was actually delivering my last baby um, because you get some odd questions when you're in a wheelchair um, and you're pregnant and I won't go into them. But again, um, I think that was the proudest moment to naturally deliver um, my daughter and to continue being trying to be the best mum. So the um, future for me is just aiming sport wise to the Paralympic Games uh, for women, uh, women only category in para ice hockey. Um, personally, again, just rocking the same with life. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how I follow that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess my greatest achievement is to have, um, I don't know, kept the charity going for 18 years um, and really supporting as a team. We've got an amazing team. 97% of, of us are, uh, are parent carers of um, children, neurodivergent special needs. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, just the most amazing families um, changing lives. Um, yeah, um, and I guess also being an advocate for my daughter, because um, she was the one that started it all. Really. This moment, and what's next, Sophie? Um, in terms of my role being re elected for a second year as disabled student officer, was really great because it made me proud knowing that people thought I'd done a good enough job of advocating for them last year that they wanted me to do it again. Um, so I'm really happy that I get the chance to do that and to use my experience and what I learned last year. Um, and what I'd like to work towards in general is just kind of supporting um, our inclusion and communities also with their projects for Disability History Month and then working on my manifesto points. Um, but I mean, my proudest moment probably at the moment is in my academic life because I'm training uh, to be a psychological wellbeing practitioner and it's taken a lot to get to this point. So I'm really proud of that and that I might get to support people like me in the future. And I'm not really qualified to answer that question, I would think, um, but I will try to to uh, to answer it in a different way. Um, I think I'm proud of myself for being able to talk to teachers about inclusion. As I could have done several other other topic subjects in my um, academic career, but I decided to devote it to this. So I'm very proud for contributing to to the cause. Um, and um, otherwise, seeing um, although I don't have an SCN or a disability, um, I am not a home. Um, I wasn't a home student when I uh, first came in England. I'm a, I was an, a European student. I decided to um, stay here and live and work here. And in a way, um, I've been through a journey to try and fit in um, in the in, in a new environment. So I understand very well um, uh, what we are talking about here. So um, the the next significant goal I think that I'm going to work towards is to give a pat on my back, really, to say, okay, well done, Anna. You're doing the best you can um, with uh, with with what you've got. Thank you. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, I think that's all we have time for this evening. So please, I ask all of you to uh, join with me to thank very much to Anna, to Sophie, to Ruth and to Danny. Thank you very much. Could I also ask you to thank our wonderful BSL interpreters, Felicity uh, and Anna. And thank you to all of you that have joined us either here this evening or online. Look out for more events for Disability History Month, which continues until the 16th of December. Uh, thank you all very much and good night.